Hi everyone, Harry Frank from Ride Giant here. In this tutorial, I'd like to talk about the emitter section in Trap Code Particular. Now, to go through the basics of the emitter section, I'd like to jump into the designer window because this is going to be a really good place to show you the settings in real time and talk about two of the main concepts to understand with respect to the emitter. So down here in the emitter section, you'll notice that there are two different blocks. And if I select these, you'll see one set of parameters right here. And if I select the other one, the motion block, you'll see a different set of parameters. The first block, the emitter type, contains parameters that relate to where the particles are created in space. Not only their three-dimensional starting location, but the area in which they are created. By default, they are created at a single point. And this is known as a point emitter. But these can be created in a larger area, such as a volume, like a box, or a sphere, grid shapes, or even three-dimensional OBJ models. And the size of the box is defined right down here, where it says emitter size. And this can either be X, Y, Z linked, so this is one slider that controls X, Y, and Z. Or this can be X, Y, Z individual, and this will give us individual controls over the X, Y, and Z size. Now I'm going to jump over to the other block and turn the velocity down to zero so that it's easier to visualize this area in which the particles are created. So let's say I was creating a large volumetric dust. I would want this to be a little bit larger than my field of view. So I want this to be a little bit larger than my comp size, which is 1920 by 1080. Now the size that I use in Z is going to be more of an aesthetic call, but I like to make this kind of deep or dust. So I'll make this a really large Z emitter. So let's talk about their movement. Their velocity is how fast they are moving. Note that velocity can be positive or negative. Particles can move in a positive direction or in a negative direction. Now, this default setting of uniform doesn't really show a whole lot of difference between positive and negative. What a uniform direction means is that particles will move randomly in all directions, all X, Y, and Z axes. So they can move away from the center towards the center, away from the camera towards the camera. They will move in all random directions. Now, if I set this to directional, particles are going to move in a very specific direction. So if I turn up this velocity, we'll see that they are generally moving away from the camera. If I set the velocity to a negative direction, we'll see that particles are now moving toward the camera. Note that they are not moving in a straight line. And this is what the direction spread is. So as particles are generated in all those random points in space, they are generally moving in a direction, but they're not moving in a very straight direction because we have this direction spread set to 20%. If I set this all the way down to zero, we'll see that particles are moving straight toward the camera. If I flip this velocity to a positive direction, particles are now moving away from the camera. Now, if I go to the rotation, this is gonna rotate the entire emitter. So if I want these particles moving to the right, a very easy way to do this would be to simply rotate the emitter 90 degrees in the Y axis. But when you do this, understand that we've rotated the entire emitter. Because I've rotated my emitter, my x-axis is now largely going to dictate how deep this area is. And the z-axis is essentially going to control the horizontal width of it because I've rotated the entire emitter in the y-axis. If I reset this back to zero, and I set my x and y emitter axes back to where I had them before. I'd like to show you yet another way to create that sort of dust look. Now I'm going to go back to our motion here and I'll set this back to uniform. If we're talking about dust, dust does have a bit of a random movement to it. So I do want my dust moving in all directions just a bit. I'd like an overall push of the particles in a certain direction. So I'm going to keep this velocity fairly low, but I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to one of these blocks here, which is the physics block, and go to wind and just give an ever so slight push in the x axis. So the combination of this wind pushing our particles slightly to the right 
as well as their overall velocity emitting in a randomly uniform direction. I think this goes a long way to creating that sort of dust movement that I was looking for. Now note that direction spread really isn't going to have any effect because uniform is by definition all directions randomly. So far we've mostly talked about uniform direction and directional direction. There's a few other options in here that I wanted to explain exactly what they do. So if I set this to bidirectional, this is essentially just like directional, except that it moves in two directions at the same time. There's really not much more to explain about this other than understanding the fact that this doesn't change your particles per second count. So if I move from directional, we'll have twice as many particles on one side versus bidirectional, which will split the particle count between both sides of the emitter. A disk is similar to a uniform emitter, but instead of emitting in all three axes, it essentially emits in two axes, resulting in a sort of disk-like shape. Lastly, we have outwards, and we're not going to see any difference with outwards if I leave this set to a point emitter. I'll set this to a sphere emitter, and go back to uniform, and we can see that we have particles moving in all directions. They're random in all directions. Some of them can be moving outward, some of them can be moving towards the center. If I switch this to outwards, particles will always move away from the center of the emitter. That's really the only difference with outwards. Next, I'd like to talk about the velocity controls in detail. Now, to show this, I'm going to change to a box emitter and make this directional and rotate this 90 degrees on its side. And this will give us a pretty good visual indication as to the velocities of our particles. I'll also set my directional spread to zero, and I think I'll zero out the emitter size in X and Z turn up the emitter size y. I'll set the particle lifespan to a really long lifespan just so that we can see them all the way to the other side of the screen. And let me go to the motion block and take a look at the velocity controls here. Particle velocity is the velocity of any given particle at the time it is born. And that's a very critical thing to understand. If I change velocity over time via keyframing, this will not have particles accelerate because the velocity is handed off to a particle at the time it is born. Now we have a certain amount of randomness above and below this velocity defined by the velocity random. So with a velocity of 100 and velocity random of 20, we will have values as high as 120 pixels per second and as low as 80 pixels per second. So if I turn up the velocity random to say 50, we can see that we have a greater range of random values assigned to our particles. If I set this to zero, we can see that they are all moving the exact same speed. So if I set that back to 50, I'd like to talk about the velocity distribution. Velocity distribution is controlling the randomness of the values. So right now, we're creating random values above and below 100. Those random values can be closer to 100, or they can be much more spread out over the range of values. So right now, our range would be between 50 and 150. With a very low velocity distribution, our random values will be very close to the original value. In fact, if I set the velocity distribution to zero, they will all be 100. If I set this to a very low value like 0.1, we will mostly see values that are very close to 100. If I turn up the velocity distribution, we are much more likely to see values spread out over the full range of random values. So we're much more likely to see velocities anywhere from that 50 to 150 random value range. So if I'm working with my default emitter here, and I turn up the velocity random, you can see that particles become more likely to go further in space. Now if I want to see more of those particles going even further in space, I can turn up the velocity distribution. If I don't want to see those extremes, I can keep a low velocity distribution.
Much more easy to understand and explain is velocity from motion. So I've mentioned that particle velocity is defined by the velocity setting right here. So at the time it's born, it will inherit this value, plus its randomness. We can add additional velocity to the particles depending on the movement of the emitter. And I can even do this right here within the designer. As I scrub the emitter around, I'm adding velocity to the emitter itself. And that velocity of the emitter can be handed off to the particles. Now, right now, it's only handing 20% of its movement to the particles. So if I turn this velocity random down, if I start on one side and I quickly move to the other side, we can see that we are throwing particles to the left. Or if I move in the opposite direction and I move to the right, we can see that we throw particles to the right because it's inheriting the velocity from the emitter. Take note that this can also be negative. So the particles will actually move in the opposite direction of the emitter. Lastly, in this lesson, I'd like to talk about the grid emitter. And as you can see, it emits a grid within the emitter size that we've defined. So if I set this to x, y, z individual, I can drag out x and y to fill the area of my composition. And note that we have particles in x, y, and z down here in the grid emitter options. So not only do we have x, y, and z size, but we have x, y, and z count. So if I set the particles in x to, let's say, 12, and the particles in y to 8, we'll see a lot more particles being generated. Also, I'm going to take my camera and rotate it on just a slight angle here. My emitter size is set to 500, so if I set this value to a higher value such as 4, if I go on my side here, we can see that we've got front to, to back four layers of particles. So rather than having your particles emit in random areas in, let's say, a box shape, the grid emitter lets you emit particles in very specific locations. There's one option for the grid emitter that is not visible here in the, in the designer. So let's go back to After Effects here. So we're using our grid emitter. I've got this now set to 100 particles per second. Down here in the grid emitter options, we've got our particles X, Y, and Z. And then we have this type here, which is set to periodic burst. And what this means is that these particles will be generated at once, all on the same frame and they will remain there until the end of their lifespan, which is three seconds, and then they will continue generating again based on how many particles per second you've got, how many particles in X, Y, and Z that you've got. It can take a little bit of math to figure out how many particles you actually need to use to continuously see them, because at 100 particles per second, divided over 12 by 8 by 4, you can start to see your particles sort of disappear because you just don't have enough particles to cover the whole grid at every point in time, which I know gets a little bit confusing. So a simpler approach is to simply use traverse. And traverse is simply goes through point by point and generates a particle uh, one at a time along this grid. Now, you can see a couple practical examples of grid emitters in the presets. If I go to backgrounds, there's this preset called hexagon grid. Now, this is using some things that we haven't covered yet, but you can see if I solo this master system, we're simply using a grid emitter that's a little bit bigger than the comp, and I'm using 24 by 20 particles. Instead of using one of the standard particle types, it's using a custom particle. And we actually have two systems that are very similar. If I turn this one off in Solo System 2. They're almost identical. The only difference is that I've offset one of the grids from the other, creating this sort of offset grid effect, which I think is pretty fun. Grid emitters are a very effective way at creating background designs like this. Now, as much as we've covered, there's still so much more to cover. And in the next lesson, we're going to get into something called light emitters, which are extremely powerful, and I use them all the time. So we'll see you in the next lesson.